Hey everybody, welcome to Surface Level, a show that takes a look at society's expectations and rejects the ones we don't see it for, all from the perspective of three Black queer best friends. I'm one of your hosts, Damon, and today, Tony, Jordan, and I are discussing the aftermath of Miss Roman. What's your quarantine life looking like past, present, and future? What matters to you most going into the 2020 election? This is the politics of quarantine. The politics of quarantine. All right, so topic's a bit heavy today, but we're going to start off on a light note. Okay, good. <laughs> a bit of this and that. I'm getting into some things. And figuring out what type of quarantine girl you've been for the last, what, I guess two and a half months that we've been shut in the house in New York City? Oh, mm-hmm. many different answers. <laughs> All right, so were you the girl that was 100% quarantined? Or are you tipping out from time to time? Jordan? Ooh. Ooh. I felt like it was going to be on me first. I was 100% quarantined for the first 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Which is my in New Jersey. <laughs> and, right. And then I went home to New Jersey um, and quarantined with my family. And then I came to New York and quarantined for another 24 hours. And then mm. I hung out with a few um, close friends because I was alone. So, yeah, I, t- I tipped more um, <laughs> more often than not. Uh, I definitely, like, in the beginning, you know, everyone was on lockdown. Everyone was scared. Everyone was following and abiding by the rules. But over the course of the period of time, I think that there's been some leniency. So it's like if... I, I don't know if I made this up, but I started calling it quarantine cells. So if you if you was quarantined for that two weeks and you didn't come down with anything, and so was I, then I think it's okay. You can come over, maybe. But that was it. I mean, nothing crazy like what we've seen some others out there doing. So I think I, I, I did a little tipping around, but nothing crazy. I think very close friends, people I knew well, and... In most cases, doing activities outside, or in some cases, some indoors, but remaining as safe as possible while keeping my sanity. And I think that's the goal, for, especially for New Yorkers living in our tiny-ass apartments. Very true. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So, in the times where you were stuck in the house, were you reading a bunch of books or depleting the Netflix catalog? Mm. Tony. I won't say I was reading a bunch of books. I w- I think more so watching a lot of shows that I wanted to catch up on that, you know, maybe I didn't give myself the time to do when life was regular. And then um, like podcasts and stuff like that, because I do enjoy like an audio moment. So that mm-hmm. was me. I think for me, I was definitely reading a lot less and watching a lot more TV. Mm -hmm. For me, reading was a commute activity um, to and from work. And because I don't have a commute, because my commute's from my bedroom to my living room, Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't reading as much. And because I was home a lot more often, I was like, oh, I can actually like watch TV. So same similar to Tony, I was catching up on a lot of shows that I wanted to see and a lot that I didn't, like Tiger King. Mm, so good <laughs> I didn't need that I could get those eight hours of my life back <laughs> um, that was hooked <laughs> I realized really quickly that I didn't want to watch a shit ton of TV um, but you never want to watch TV I, I thought I like I like shows and things but I just wasn't motivated to do it and even like I read some things but I wasn't crazy reading but I also like made random art and I painted and I bought a plant and took care of my new plant and bought a bike and rode that. And like, to me, like those were better uses of my time than I mean, like binge watching. You shit. are the resident activity chair. <laughs> so I just like, sounds, it sounds right. I, I just like to express myself in different ways. And I just sitting and also when I was working, especially like staring at that fucking computer screen all day and then staring at another screen all night and then getting my bed and staring at my phone screen. I, I, I needed a break. It's killing my eyes. <laughs> mm. It's really mm. killing It's like the girls are going to be wearing Warby Parker out, getting new frames. And the blue light lens don't, they ain't helping. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, finally, Leslie Jordan or Tabitha Brown for president? Ooh. Mm. 
<laughs> you know, can we have president and vice president? <laughs> what, up to you. Because, you know, I would say Tabitha for president because she's black, first of all. And, you know, that's her business. <laughs> um, and she just, she, a woman, you know, a woman is sensible. She'll, I think we need that. But then Leslie Jordan, he brings that element of surprise, um, surprise and delight. And he's also gay. So both my, my minority, you know, being black and gay, I get the best of both worlds with the two of them in office. I have to agree. I think Tabitha, mm -hmm. because you have to understand that I would never consider ever becoming a vegan. And she has somehow made it so that I would consider vegan meals mm -hmm. and cook them. Um, I think that's a lot of power. But I also really have a soft spot for really funny old people. Mm -hmm. So, like, Leslie holds a very sweet... He would read like, you for calling him old. Right. Oh, <laughs> no. Yes. No, he wouldn't. Yes, I feel like he, he makes fun of it in his videos, he, no? Child, he make a funny himself. That don't mean he gonna let you do. I mean, he's, you know. Yeah, he... Yeah. I don't... <laughs> a man of a certain age. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, Tabitha, for sure. And then that video where she was crying, I was just like, oh. She was embracing her southern accent. It was beautiful. I loved it. She's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Tabitha for president. I mean, Leslie, we cut the girls up, and that's how I like a vice president. Okay. Rip them up. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the, the 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 guard dog, whatever they. The vice president is supposed to tear girls up. Mm. Um, so that kind of gives, I guess, some clues about us and how we've experienced the last two and a half, you very unique months in New York City. Um, so I guess to put more context around that, what's been kind of the hardest and easiest parts about going through this process and then quarantining, et cetera. Um, Jordan? So I'll, I'll start with the hardest. I think for me, the hardest part about the quarantine is just the anxiety of not knowing, mm -hmm. um, not being sure about anything. I think that starting off, like I joke about, you know, having stepping out and tipping, but I was very responsible about it. It was like tipping to like the same two people's places. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a lot of anxiety that came along with not knowing if you contracted the virus, not knowing if you were going to wake up the next morning and have like shortness of breath. Um, and I just think that, you know, I went home too for a family emergency and I have like older people um, in my family that are there with pre-existing conditions. And it was just, it was like a lot of stress, just not knowing what was going on. If you felt like you were too close to someone in the grocery store that you may have contracted it. So I think the anxiety was definitely the hardest. I think the easiest, which was kind of surprising to me, was that um, I adjusted very quickly to quarantine. And I think that I found a lot of ways to entertain myself. Like I grew up spending a lot of time with myself. So like watching TV, having concerts in my apartment. What you perform? <laughs> um, I performed a lot of Beyonce. Mm -hmm. What's your um, signature? End of time. Full choreography. The full choreography, okay. but only from the but only from the Super Bowl. That's the uh, choreography with, with the butt twerk. Yes, that's that was a okay. that was a different intro for the finale of our podcast. Jordan will be performing on live. I will. The end of time. Exactly. The audio, Can I do a song off of my new album? The only the audio only version. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think is I, I felt I felt like I was like adjusting like very well to sort of like waking up just being in my apartment. Um, I live very close to Central Park, so I would like take walks there and I, I bike now. So yeah, um, that's that was pretty easy for me. Tony? Well, for me, it's like I hate it here and I love it here. <laughs> you know, that's the love-hate of quarantine, love-hate relationship that I've had. Uh, in the beginning, the hardest part was really adjusting to not having the autonomy to just come and go as I please. Like, I do appreciate my alone time and I, I like to, to be home, but I also enjoy being able to have, you know, the freedom to come and go and like step out if I want to. And I felt like we were being robbed of that and kind of like on house arrest. Like that's what I kind of equate. I was like, this is what house arrest must feel like. But like, you know, thank goodness that we, I feel like we're blessed and I was thankful to still be working, but it was an adjustment period that I had to get used to a bit of a culture shock. So you don't like handcuffs at home? 
Well, I, I actually <laughs> own a pair of hands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm known to, you know, to, you know, by who? invite a couple things into the bedroom, <laughs> Ooh, you know, every now and again. Because yeah, that's but, your business. But yeah, it's, that is my business. And so I think the easiest part, and Devon, you probably agree with me and Jordan as well, is is taking a break from these people. <laughs> like that was, That's I was like, surprisingly easy. Yeah. It's just been like, okay, I love that it's forced everyone to have a seat um, from everyone who's, you know, more introverted to the extroverts. And I worry about people's mental health, but I also think that people need this. And it's the thing that you didn't know you need, need it. Now, here we are two and a half months, three months later, where it's just getting, it's kind of like, all right, monotonous. But I enjoyed like stepping back and not, you know, stepping back from society a little bit, especially going through what we're going through right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Jamon? Um, <laughs> It's funny that you mentioned it that way, because I guess the thing I would say most people wouldn't say, but I would say the easiest part was actually losing my job. Mm. I would say that going into this experience, I had all this anxiety around keeping my job. Mm -hmm. And then I worked in a, at a pace going into this. So I was just like, I'm working harder at my house than I have ever in the office. Oh yeah. That's yeah. Stress. Um, and I think that like I, I've worked in fashion and in a retail company where like budgets had to be brought down because obviously stores were closed and the business outlook going forward is low and, mm -hmm. and my company decided that it needs to make cuts and not based on my performance, but just based on the fact that they didn't have the budget to keep me. And I think, and when I took the time to think about it, I was just like, I needed the break. I needed the time to breathe. I felt in a lot of ways that I'm very grateful for that experience because it helped me grow a lot professionally, but I felt like I accomplished all the things that I was meant to at that place. Mm -hmm. um, I interacted with people in a way that centered my blackness and my queerness in a way that I think a lot of them hadn't necessarily thought about in professional settings before. I would say the same with how I approached the work I did because it's fashion. So right. it, it is more social than a lot of um, other industries. So I think that I put my experience in the forefront for a lot of people that wouldn't have necessarily thought about it because fashion is filled with just a lot of rich kids from various places who have very narrow views of the world. So and. Right. And in looking back, like, I don't feel like I missed anything, mm -hmm. nor do I feel like I needed to linger in that experience any longer. Um, mm. yeah, so, you yeah, seem, you seem very, you seem very light. Your energy seemed very yeah. light after it, that. Like, it you was, seemed like you were able to, like, relax and sort of enjoy the core, like, not enjoy the quarantine, but, like, take full but, advantage. Yeah, of, like, just be present in it. And I, I couldn't be present yeah. because it was just, like, constant running around for trying to sell people non-essential clothes right mm -hmm. and and that's not to say that there is not art and beauty and fashion like I, I take that industry and what i've done very seriously and i'm that was a little flippant but but i think that to me was the thing that i thought going into it i have all this anxiety around like i love my lifestyle and i like i like nice things right but I would not have lived the last month of my life differently. Yeah, I mean, is timing I is timing is everything. God's plan, like, right. I think that the way it was supposed to happen is the way it happened. Right, and that's that's good for you. Good for you. And I'm not, and I, yeah, I could be giving myself anxiety around a bunch of things, but like, why? Like the 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 world's on fire. Like, what am I gonna do about it? Right. So wait. So the so the easiest part was losing your job. What was the hardest part? Well, the hardest part was being in this entire situation and realizing that in America, black lives still don't fucking matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like, I was was going through some things last week, and at the point for which we're we're recording this, so that people have context, is really in the midst of kind of the breakout of all the protests and things, and. Um, I 
got on Instagram without my face on, wig not, tied all <laughs> right. And, and it was because I had been like crying all night about things in my personal life. And I cried all morning about things going on in the world in regards to y'all's president, in regards to to just the, 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 the feedback about people being shot down or people being murdered in the streets and mm. still people not getting it. And still people making it seem like it's about being anti-police mm-hmm. or making it feel like people are disrespecting police or, or and so on. And, and, and for me that I, I, I remember when the quarantine situation first started, I thought there would be this moment of national unity. I thought that not with this president. That I was like, you know what? This is something that what like you can be black, brown, white, purple, beige, rainbow colored. It's going to affect you. And I learned really quickly that that shit didn't matter. Right. Black people start dying more quickly than everybody else because of pre-existing conditions, and they were like, "Well, fuck it, let's just open all the states back up." Mm. And then the protest started. Yes. And the protests evolved into a lot of variations of protests. So I want, I guess, to con- to transition kind of into this very specific moment in history. And what has been you guys' experiences with the protests, with what's happening, with the means that people are using to v- give themselves voice? What What do you think? Um, mm-hmm. Tony, maybe start with you. Well, for me, first of all, with everything going on, and, and, you know, there have been a few more black lives that have been taken by the likes of these police officers out here who are supposed to be protecting our lives. Right. Uh, and the outrage, like we've seen it all before. We've seen the protests. We've seen the backlash and the outrage. We've seen, you know, people speaking out and the looting and the, the, the anger. But I, this felt different. Uh, and it hit different and I've actually never attended a protest nor did I ever feel like I wanted to go to one because mm-hmm. of what you see but when they rolled out the lineup of where they were going to be protesting you know I saw that one was right here in Harlem literally like yeah. outside my apartment and I felt like what's stopping me from going to check it out um, I want to be in the environment. I want to see what's going on. I want to support. So I felt inclined to go do that. And it was yeah. liberating. And just to see everyone, you know, and be there in real time, speaking out and standing up for what's right. And I saw a wide range of people from think- every black person in Harlem to well, even, even white families. That out was there. the thing that, like, we, Tony and I, and I went together and the thing that surprised me the most and the thing that feels most different about this moment is that it's not just black people shouting into an abyss again about the same things happening. Right. Like we saw like the, 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 it's weird. Like social media is typically this thing that exists and then there's the real world Mm -hmm. that process to me, which was quite peaceful represented the same thing I see happening on social media. Like yeah. it was, it was Harlem, and it still was not just black people. Full families of all people of all different backgrounds and age groups, etc. And for me, it was really uplifting to see that someone, at least for today, because I can't even who knows what will happen tomorrow. But for today, someone gave a damn. Right. I think the differentiation between what's going on now and what we've seen is that everyone is holding non-black people accountable. accountable. For like, for real this time, it's like silence is not an option. If you are silent, you're part of the problem and we're calling you out on your bullshit. Right. And part of the reason I was so fucking exhausted, like I I posted this video and I was just like, I'm exhausted because it was just like, I'm, I I can't watch another video of a black man or woman person be gunned down, be, have their neck knelt on until they can't fucking breathe anymore. I can't watch that anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm tired of trying to explain to people my pain and and what is hurtful about it. Mm-hmm. I'm tired of being the only person to show up when we want to peacefully protest or if we want to 
um, express ourselves on social media. And I just don't, I, and for me, it was really inspiring to see that for once it was not just me. And in the space where I'm fucking tired, it, in this moment, at least, it felt like there was support. Yes. Jordan, what are, what are you thinking? Um, so when when the protest for Harlem came up, I think the, the way the text message group between us happened was that um, I think you post, Damon, I think you posted the um, the the picture of or the flyer with the details of logistics of where it was going to be. And I was just like immediately I was like, I'm not going to be there. I've never been to a protest before um, and I didn't plan on going to one um, this time. And then as I like slept on it and thought about it. I let Tony and Demond know that I was going to go to the protest. And then about an hour and a half before the protest, I decided to not go. I think for me, um, it was a mental back and forth. I, I, I was trying to decide whether or not I was comfortable enough to go because I think that for me, I consume a, a lot of Twitter and a lot of social media in terms of what's going on and with these protests. And I don't know if it's just my algorithm, but like I was seeing the worst of it. Like I was seeing people injured. I was seeing people getting ran over by police cars. I was seeing people getting like shoved into the streets all by the force of like police officers exerting unnecessary force. And I think that for me, I just got worried about it. And then on top of that, you know, like the biggest anxiety that I have around this entire time period is like, the, the fact that there's an airborne disease going on. And I thought that those mass crowds was, it just made me very uncomfortable. So at the last second, um, I decided to not go. I think that in retrospect, I kind of regret it because the protest actually ironically came down my exact street and I was able to see the protest. And I saw it as a, a civil, respectful protest that didn't have violence, that had people of all walks of life, all ages. And, you know, I thought that I wanted to be a part of that. So I think that moving forward, I will consider it greatly and I will sort of allow myself the space to experience it for myself and not just rely on what I'm being served on social media to make that decision for me. But I think that I just didn't feel didn't feel comfortable. And I also a part of me feels like there's a there's a group on social media that makes people feel like they aren't down for the community if they don't go to protests which I don't agree with. I think there's a lot of different ways that you can show your support for a cause. I think there's ways you can get involved, obviously donating and helping people who are um, who are getting arrested at these protests and, and, and bailing them out. Obviously, the, like one of the most impactful things that you can probably do is voting um, in the primary. So I think that for protests, like I haven't been to one. Um, I didn't go to this one. I would consider going to another one because, as Tony said, I do think that this feels a lot different than any protest before that I've experienced, like, from the sideline. I mean, I get that, because don't get me wrong, like, I definitely was not, I'm not enthused about when they get crazy, but I, I knew it had a start time of, like, 1 p.m., and I said, okay, I want to go check it out in the beginning. I want to be in the environment, but I didn't want to necessarily be, like, in, in the the throes of it because I had never experienced it before and I do know that there can be they can get violent and I also didn't know when I would ever have the opportunity again like this will probably happen again but this moment feels like inflection yeah like I was having a very inter- interesting discussion with someone a couple of days ago about when we look at these points in history that are about rights and that are about civil rights or women's rights gay rights um black rights etc like there, there's this question of like what are you willing to sacrifice mm-hmm. there are people in this world that will literally die so that the three of us can walk through the streets and hopefully not be misinterpreted as something and be gunned down by a police officer or Mm -hmm. be mistaken for someone or have someone run in our home and not see us and immediately just start shooting or whatever the scenario is. Mm -hmm. If that's an extreme, going out into the streets to protest is is in a lot of ways, I think, for the people that view it as, as gainfully important, is the bare minimum we could be doing. Yeah. Like, no one's asking people to 
riot or no one's asking you to tear some shit up or if things start going to that way you can very easily exit like tony and i were at the protest and like we weren't in the the depths of the crowd like we were still socially distant we were across the street it was really large on one to 125th street so there was definitely room to be as far apart as you needed to be and i think that so many times like we accept these narratives that media perpetuates for us like but- I, I, I kind of disagree because we have a friend, all three of us, who was arrested at a protest because they were trying to get a better angle to take pictures at the protest. Yeah, he got arrested and he was released. So again, it goes to the question of what are you willing to sacrifice? I, we are People are protesting their lives. I get that. And I think that there's a lot of different ways that you can, you know, set the tone for the community and you can make a point for the community. I don't think that protesting is the only way. So what are you doing? I think that I'm be- being a positive example in spaces that aren't really, th- that don't really represent black people, I think makes a difference. What's the, what do you mean by being a positive example? I think that by showing people like in, in spaces that I work in where like I'm the only black person, being a force there and being being proud of my blackness and also being a person that achieves a lot in my role, I think that, that shifts perceptions. I don't think that it moves perceptions as quick and as drastically as maybe protesting and putting your life on the line, but I do think there's value in it. So did you have discussions this week with any of your coworkers about the things going on in the world? I haven't talked to my coworkers at all. Had no one's brought it up. I mean, but today, no it but up. today's also Monday. No, no one's brought it up. Or last, it's been going on for a week. Like yeah, that's what I, I mean. Like, like it's it's. I think as a black man, it is no longer enough for us to feel as like good, educated Negroes that we just go to work and do a good job, and that is enough. We are in a place where people are being like people are still being killed, and it's on. Social media, it's on the news. It's becoming a norm for Black people. And I think that everyone has to start doing more. And that goes for the white people who were fucking silent before. And it goes for people like us who have felt for a long time that going to work and then donating a little bit of money to something is enough because it's not. And it, it goes back to my question of what are you sacrificing? If there are P- and, that, and that's not just for you. That's for me, too. And, and anyone. I don't agree that you need to put yourself in danger. I didn't say put yourself in danger. I said, have you said anything to people who know nothing about um, Black Lives Matter, to know nothing about police brutality? Have you posted anything to your social media that informs people about these things? Have you have you done any of that? Yes. I follow you on social media and you haven't. You didn't look at my stories the other day because I I definitely posted your story where you posted that. Oh, this is what happened in Minnesota. Yes. Everyone knows what happened in Minnesota. I'm sorry, but I don't need to be policed on like what I'm putting on my social media. And if you feel like it wasn't informative enough for you, it may have been for someone else. I'm not. I'm to, just, you, I think you need to take into account that you are very far along into your activism. And I think that you're very passionate not. about it. I'm not but that I far. Think I'm, that I'm, I'm black just stages, like you. I understand that. Yes. And I'm not saying it's not about being far into my activism. It's about me, my, me saying that in life, it's life or death for people. And it's not, we all need to step a, a step out of our conven- our comfort zone and our convenience. Like we do so many things based on like just far enough. So like nothing in my life changes. Yeah, And I, I think, think it's important for us to, to challenge ourselves to put, put things that, that we value on the line. Like, I, like there are so many people in my, when I, at my, in my former job that I spoke to about these matters who in this last week were texting me and saying, you know what? Thank you for bringing those things up to me because it helped me see this situation differently than I ever would have seen it before because you talked very directly to me about it. And I think that matters. And it was a thing that most people, most black people will not do in a corporate setting because they constantly feel like I have to censor myself or I have to be the good Negro that like everyone likes. And that I'm, I'm just here to do my job. Well, I want to be clear that I do have uncomfortable conversations about race with people in the workplace. And we've talked about this in the last job that I've had when I talked to someone who was yeah, a far you, right you, person. Yes, and it was, and but it was only valuable when it was important specifically to you. It wasn't valuable. They were offending my intern. Again, it was an environment that is focused specifically on you. I think that we need to allow people 
to move at their pace. I think that I, I, I appreciate the fact that you're very passionate about this, but I think that there are people that are making changes. I think that a lot of people are at different stages of you know their involvement and their contribution and their sacrifice and i think that just because you're further along doesn't give you the right to make it to make people feel bad for the contributions that they if are if you making. feel bad it's because you're not contributing enough i feel like i haven't I feel said bad. anything to you that makes you feel bad i feel like you cutting me off and you like making it seem like i'm not doing anything or not doing enough or you're discounting the things that i put on my social media i feel like that makes me feel like it's insufficient it is insufficient you okay. shouldn't feel bad about it mm -hmm. I mean, okay. I think I agree that people are at their own different paces of coming to grasp with the issues. You know, for me, I was waiting for it. Like this week, it was the first opportunity for people at my job to be, to bring it up or to ask me or to say anything about it. And they did. I, you know, my boss, we had our 10 a.m. meeting. And the first thing he asked was like, are you OK? I know you're one of the only ones of us that's left in the city. Everyone's kind of like vacated to other homes. He brought it up, asked questions. They wanted to know about my safety. They brought me in on meetings because the company is trying to deal with like how to message these things out. So I appreciated that. And I fortunately work with some quality white people i guess that, <laughs> that you know at least will ask the question and they do care and they want to know what they can do and they're as to where before it wasn't like that no one brought it up last week at all but the company like i think the company putting out statements and being from the top from the ceo kind of gives everyone else a little bit of like okay if our ceo is making this statement he's saying we stand with black people it kind of empowers them a little bit more, but I do agree with Damon in the, in the sense of like, we have to be that person to champion and be the one to bring the issue to the table if, because it, it is on us if we're in those spaces, but it, I don't think it means that's your job to do so because everyone's not that way. And I don't judge you either way, but I know it can get very heated because these are sensitive topics and it's a sensitive issue. No, so. I just think that it is on every person in this country, abroad, in the world to do the work of seeing Black people as human. And I think that when you think about the consequence, the consequence is consistently Black men and Black women losing their lives. Like we're not even in like the socioeconomic disparities, the health disparities, which all contribute to the same things, but like the brute force of people losing their lives from people who are sworn to protect us. And if all that we as humans do is continue to think to do the things that make us comfortable and to continue mm -hmm. to do the things that 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 like shit, Beyonce could have done more than can do more than post that fucking beauty glam video she did the other day. Like, it, it's just like what I, I like, there has to be an outcry for more. There has to yeah. be. People are dying. Right. Like, it's not, it's, it's no longer, it, it's not like the, the fight for gay marriage. We're like, mm -mm. The, I absolutely believe in gay marriage, but like, that is not life or death for humans. When it's the issue of life or death and your right to exist and to live, I, I, I would hope, I believe that we should do more. And then when you start doing more, there's more you can do from that. And then for so on. And th like, that's that's how I feel. No, and I think we're, we're hopefully with this point in time, it's moving in a different direction. I agree. Uh, so yeah. I'm seeing people move differently and it, that little bit helps. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we can build so, off that momentum. Well, let's keep building to November. 2020. Mm. Child, we thought we were coming into this year and that was going to be the highlight, but... <laughs> Please. Right. <laughs> we are so far away from that it, idea. It feels like... Oh, my God. So, in this moment in time, what are the issues that matter most to you guys? Um, Jordan, let's start with you. Let's see. I, I, I don't... That's such an interesting question because I, I'm not sure if this is the most important to me, but it's definitely the most top of mind. Um, in terms of policy. And I think that it's um, access to quality education mm -hmm. um, within black and brown communities and low income communities. I think that a lot of people are seeing the disparity between 
access to quality education, especially with quarantine going on and right. lower income families maybe not having more access to digital devices. I've been seeing a lot of stories where, mm-hmm. you know, multi-children households, they have to take turns with the devices to fill out their homework and they're just not able to be as engaged because they don't have as many resources available. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's this is not a new issue, obviously, like quarantine has amplified it and it's giving um, pe- journalists more stories to talk about this um, this epidemic. But it's, it's, it's no... It's no like surprise that in low income communities, you know, teachers are less like lower paid. They're less likely to be certified. Mm -hmm. It's just it's not fair. And I do believe that education and access to quality education helps the community a lot. I think that's where you see the ROI, honestly, in our communities, like Mm -hmm. by educating our youth. I think that's super important. And um, I commend Detroit, who has recently um they, they, I think they upped their their minimum or their starting salary to fifty one thousand dollars for teachers, and they're trying to create, mm. um, I guess, more interest in students at, at colleges to be interested in um, careers in education. So I think that's really cool. But there obviously needs to be a whole lot more. Right. Um, I just think that it's it's really sad to see a lot of these kids, a lot of the people in our community, not really being able to reach their full potential because they don't even know. Like they can't even tap into their true talents because they don't even have the course options right. to be able to do so. So I think that a, a platform that is going to support quality access to education across low income communities, specifically black and brown, is a huge priority for me. Mm. Yes. So for me, my 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 biggest priority would be getting 45 out <laughs> like that, that the biggest part like period he has to go he just has to go and i hope that people take what's going on now and keep that same energy come november when the election happens because we're going to need to mobilize like we've never mobilized before white supremacy is running rampant. is running rampant and it's going to have to be met with a force. And so that for me is like where my focus is. Outside of that, it's similar to what Jordan said about the disparities between non-black people and black people. But as it relates to like healthcare, uh, we, we talked about it earlier and touched upon it with like the coronavirus. It's showing the ugly truth of how Black people don't have the same access to proper health care and we're dying at a disproportionate rate. And it's very alarming. And I hope that it being exposed in this way will give people, you know, it's kind of no, there's no denying it. Like it's there in black and white. The stats are there. People see it. But hopefully people can mobilize around that as well and do something to make a difference. So those are my two things. My answer is the same that it's been for every question we've asked today. The most important thing for me is Black Lives Matter. And I think that that seems like a very large mantra, so I want to be more specific. Uh, So I read this really interesting article um, by a group of Black women. Uh, Angela Ryan, Amanda Seals contributed to it. It was in the Washington Post, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, And the title was Biden still needs Black women. Here are three things he can do. Like if we move, let's assume... Trump can please get out of office. Right. But there's still work that needs to be done on Biden's platform. They laid out ideas of one black woman as vice president. Don't mm-hmm. try that Amy Klobuchar shit. But that, <laughs> that Amy Klobuchar shit is still and, uh, well, lingering, yeah. no? Well, no, not anymore because she... Something there's happened. a whole fiasco with her and yeah. the guy that killed um, George Floyd. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when she was attorney general of Minnesota, so now it's like right. she's getting real touch. Coming back to so yeah, to bite her. Yes, yeah, coming back to bite her. Um, step two they mentioned was a black woman on the Supreme Court. Uh, it's funny that's the thing that my dad always mentions is the the one thing that he was most disappointed by in the president, the um, Obama's presidency. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's I think is important, and just because. In both of those things, because black without black women, Joe Biden wouldn't be the nominee. Without right. black women, 
most Democrats would be in office. Mm -hmm. And it's about time that they're paid with their own. That's all the time we have this week. Woo, ciao. <laughs> the ghetto. <laughs> but let's keep the conversation going. Damon, Jordan, and I would love to hear your thoughts and questions at surfacelevelpodcast.com. And if you enjoyed this discussion, please rate, review, and subscribe. And you can stay updated by following us on Instagram and subscribing to our YouTube channel at Surface Level Podcast. And remember, stay curious. <laughs>